uh, that we have a formal bio to read, but what I can tell you firsthand about Tim, who is the executive director of New England ABA, um, is that his approach to his work and the work of New England ABA and the clients that he serves has always been that of dedication, compassion, and consideration for the unique needs of every child and the family that surrounds them. Um, you are incredibly committed to seeing each child realize their fullest potential and that we, um, we so respect and appreciate in you. So Tim has partnered with our program a fair bit. He led a, an in-person terrific series called Everyday ABA um, back last spring and last fall. And those um, classes are on our website also for the BMC Autism Program. If you want to give them a watch, they can be translated into many languages. Um, it's another great way to learn more tools um, in the, around the topic of ABA. So, I think that's it for me. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. We're going to share slides and we're going to get going. I, I pull it up now. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that. I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it's I'm always uh, happy to partner with the BMC Autism Program and I appreciate the kind words. And hopefully, uh, you know, this topic that we're going to talk about today is uh, something for people that know me that I could just sit around and talk about for a long time. But I'm not going to do it too much, Sherry. As you said, you, you, you give me some of the warnings because I definitely want to hear questions. Okay, great. So we see this coming up here. Uh, so the, the, the topic today, we're going to talk about creating routines. And then I'm going to give some, I, I, I like to call them just habits to get into to help promote um, supporting behaviors with your child. So if we want to go to the next slide, we'll, we'll start to dig right in. So if, I, if I'm thinking about the purpose of this training, um, uh, you know, many families, including my family, I have four young children of my own. We, you know, kind of suddenly found ourselves at home with, you know, with our children because of COVID-19. And that, that's difficult for all families, but it certainly presents a unique, a, a unique need for uh, families of children with special needs. So what I'm gonna talk about in the next slides are evidence-based strategies in the field of applied behavior analysis. I won't get into a long-winded discussion of, of the field of applied behavior analysis, but that is what ABA at the end of New England ABA stands for. And uh, the, the research in this area is looking at what are some, what are variables in our environment that contribute to our behavior. And if we understand uh, something about those variables, then we can start to change them to promote behaviors that we want to continue and skills that we want to continue. So I do think it's important to present that, that some of these, these strategies I'm going to be talking about uh, are evidence-based. I didn't just come up with them in, you know, in my basement and then giving them to you now. So <laughs> why don't we go to the next slide? All right. Level setting here a little bit about being realistic. Sherry touched on it. I'm very happy that uh, that uh, you know that is kind of how we're known, and and I think it's very important to be realistic about um, what what you are going to be able to do as a parent and what you might not be able to do. So in the next weeks and months ahead, what I always say is we're trying to get through unscathed or escape as little as possible, right? Uh, you know. I think it would be an unrealistic expectation to, to go to a parent and say, you are now a school teacher. You are now a certified special educator. You are now a behavior analyst. And, and, and I think it's, it would be the same thing if someone came up to me and said, well, you know, I can't get a plumber out to your house for a week, so you are now a plumber. You now need to be an expert and, and, and have the same results that would happen from uh, you know, someone that's received extensive years and years of training and experience. So just, I, I just think that's a very important thing to point out. I, I think sometimes parents and I, you know, I'm the same way. Uh, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves that is just very unrealistic. So I think that's very important. I also want to point out that the things I'm going to talk about are going to be, again, evidence-based in the field of applied behavior analysis. But I, I, I want to make sure that I'm realistic that None of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be kind of a, a magic 
piece that it happens one time and it's a strategy and everything's great for every child. So I think important to know, evidence-based, you know, these are things that have been proven to work, but, you know, you, you have to know that your individual child is going to be, is going to be different and, you know, kind of results vary, if you will. So just kind of have that as a disclaimer. Also, you know, another little disclaimer, I think this is going to be for information purposes only. Uh, it would be impossible for me in an hour, you know, to really give a true kind of clinical analysis. So I, I would always say the things we're going to talk about, great advice, great habits and tips, but it shouldn't be looked at as a replacement to say, well, I, I don't need ABA therapy anymore or to consult with my BCBA because I did this program. So, all right, great. We'll go to the next slide. And so to start off, I, I thought this was interesting. This was kind of actually early on in the coronavirus uh, pandemic. My wife shared this with me. She's much more of a social media user than I am. And she said, hey, it's something really funny. And she shared with me first this COVID-19 daily schedule that someone had posted on some social media outlet. And it looks so wonderful, right? You wake up, you take a morning walk with your child. You had academic time and creative time. And then I love there's chore time on here, right? So I always feel like this is what you think the daily schedule is going to be. And then if we go to the next slide, this a lot of times is the reality of what it actually ends up becoming, right? <laughs> we wake up, you watch the iPad. I guess I have to feed you lunch. You watch a little more iPad. We do academic time, but it's also on the iPad iPad, I have to feed you again, iPad then, right? So I think, you know, what, what, what we'll talk about today is maybe trying to meet somewhere in the middle. That first one that was up there, unrealistic expectations, I, I, for, for me personally. I mean, if you get there, that's great. But, and then this one over here, probably going to be hard to sustain over time, right? Because eventually, even though, you know, your child might love the iPad, it's going to wear off over time. So we want to try to find something in, in between these two, but I thought that was kind of a, kind of a fun, uh, interesting thing to start with. So if we go to the next slide. I wanna talk first about, if, if, if I think as a behavior analyst about setting routines, the first thing I think about is let's come up with a schedule and a daily schedule. And I think to start off before we get into the strategies, a lot of times people will think, well, the materials really matter. I, you know, I, I need to go on Amazon and I need to buy every fancy thing I can possibly find and colors and, you know, uh, uh, the Thomas the Train needs to be on it and it's got to be Disney based or whatever. Um, and I think it's fine to do that. But what I always advocate for parents to do is use whatever you're going to have consistent access to. Because if you're going to make this a, a habit, something that you're going to do day in and day out, you, you want to make sure it's something you're always going to have access to. And what I've learned as a clinician is that while it might be kind of fun to have all those different kind of fun things in there, when you get right down into it, the thing that's going to make the daily schedule stick is not going to be how pretty it looks. It's going to be the science that's used behind it that kind of wins the day. So I would say, you have a whiteboard, use that. You've got a chalkboard, use that. You've got a piece of paper, use that. You have a post-it, use that. Whatever you're going to have consistent access to, use it. Um, and then also, you know, if, if your child has, you know, difficulty uh, reading or, look, or, or, you know, uh, interpreting something that's written down, use, use what you need to adapt to them. So if pictures are better, pictures are great. Tangible items can work too. You know, I've worked with children where we lay out the schedule using the item itself on the table, and we put that in order, and we have a, an actual thing that the child can touch. So sometimes you have to play around there a little bit to find out, um, but, but I think very, you know, kind of important to find that. So um, why don't we go to the next slide? All right, let's start talking about, let's start talking some strategies. So what I would recommend if you're setting up a daily schedule and trying to get a routine is that you want to mimic, and I'm, what I'm thinking about here is school, when school's closed, right? You know, there's a tendency, and we all had this even probably in our work day too, right? Where, well, I used to, you know, shower and get dressed and go into the office. Now I don't do that anymore. Should I still shower and get dressed and go in front of my computer? What I would say as a behavior analyst is yes, because what that triggers to your brain is, okay, things are different, but I have a sense of normalcy here. 
And you're going to see, my, I'm going to talk about my last bullet, bullet there. Familiarity breeds calm. Your brain likes when things are predictable. Your brain likes a routine. And so that's what we're looking to do. So I would mirror that, that morning and that after school bedtime routine as much as possible. When you get into kind of the meat of the day, what I'd recommend there is to mirror the school-based activities, again, as much as possible and as realistic, right? You're most likely not a trained special education teacher or teacher. So while I'm recommending here that you give common names to things that you're doing, right? I, I don't think you want to put the pressure on yourself to say, boy, we're going to, you know, I'm going to be just like their teacher when I do ELA, or I'm going to be just like their teacher when I do math. What I'm recommending is use some of these common names because the, when I look at that last bullet, familiarity breeds calm. If I use, if I'm working with a child and I can use the same names that they were used to at school, it's called art, it's called music, it's called ELA, recess, snack, whatever it's called, that, that will trigger in their brain a, 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 a thought of, oh, wait, I know what that is. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Recess. That's I go outside and we play. Oh, wait. ELA is when it's more of a work type activity, right? Oh, music. We're gonna do something music based. So, I I really recommend to use the exact same language. Call it the same thing. And I think this is one where if you're able to work with your child's teacher, um. You know, it's great to get work from them and suggestions, but I would very much advocate asking them directly, what do you call the activities? Or can you send me a copy of what the schedule typically looks like during the school day and then try to mirror it as much as you can? Now, I get it. There's, there's restrictions. You know, maybe your child typically eats lunch at 11 o'clock in school, but you can't do that. Understandable. I'm just saying try to mirror it as much as you can because your child is, is probably used to that. And that's kind of the routine that they're used to. I'll go into this last bullet here because I think if you're gonna get a takeaway, I think this is a big one. Familiarity breeds calm. Our, our, our brains are kind of wired that way. And I think we can all probably understand that in the coronavirus was a, a good example where our routines got thrown off, right? The things that I typically did, you know, on a Monday, all of a sudden, you know, I was doing on, I didn't know what day of the week it was, right? That was the running joke. I don't know what day of the week it is. They're all the same, you know? And that's because my brain was trying to adapt to something new. And when that happens, it makes me not calm because my brain's having to wonder what happens next. So a lot of this is trying to breathe that familiarity as much as we possibly can. Um, and that's some of the strategies in here. So if we want to run to the next slide. So I'm going to get into, I'm going to, get, I'm going to talk about two evidence-based strategies here when you're setting up that schedule. Uh, the first one we call task interspersal. What this means is that research has shown that if you can alternate between, uh, you know, hard, moderate, easy, preferred tasks in a certain sequence and order that I'm going to show later, it helps to keep someone's motivation up. This is another one that if we all think about it, we can probably agree with this. If I look at my day, my, my daily schedule and it, and, it, and it says hard, 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 how motivated do I feel even just looking at that schedule, right? I would say that is a this motivation, okay? If I look at my schedule and I see it interspersed, I see maybe I start off hard, but then I go easy. And then I do something easy again, and then I go moderate. And then I go easy. It, so if I can move around and I can intersperse in there, I'm almost giving myself a little bit of a break as I go so that I'm prepared for the moderate and then the hard tasks. I keep my motivation up. I think of it like a balloon. And if my balloon is filled with motivation, the more hard tasks I do, the more air goes out of my balloon. But then as I do easy tasks, I allow air into my balloon and I can keep myself motivated. This, it's not really a trick, it's very evidence-based. This strategy right here is very, very effective. So what, what it means though, is, is if there's a little bit of work involved here because you have to identify 
well, what are easy tasks for my child? What are moderate tasks? And then what are hard tasks? So if we go to the next slide, um, you know, what I would recommend is to kind of list those down. We'll, we'll push out a, 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 a handout that gives you a way to kind of structure this. Um, but I think it is important to, 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 to have a list of those tasks so that you kind of know what to pick from. So if you know, I'll go back to when we talked about using some of the school base. If I know that my son finds, you know, uh, math really difficult, like that is a hard, hard task. I got to make sure that I'm strategic. And what we talk about here in this slide is that in order to keep that momentum going, I want to always follow a moderate task with something that's either easy or preferred. If I remember my balloon again, if I'm giving a moderate task, I'm letting some air out of that balloon. So as soon as I do that, I wanna do that easier preferred and let it back in, right? And then if I'm gonna do a hard task, I'm letting even more air out of my balloon. So I have to follow up with a, I would recommend a preferred after that. Not just easy, but a, something that's very preferred so that I let more air in, okay? Um, and then a note here too, to remember to be realistic, you know, uh, I, you know, I would be the first one to say, you know, if I'm doing a schedule with, with my children, which I have been doing, we might do one to two hard tasks a day and that's it. You know, I, I, I we're, we're trying to get through the day. If we go back to that first slide, we're trying to get through unscathed. We're trying to get through healthy. Right. And, you know, I think if you focus too much on hard, 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 you just, that, that balloon's not gonna have any more air left in it. And as parents, we've all been there and we know what that looks like, right? Uh, that's when the behaviors come, that's when the days get really long and really hard. So definitely be realistic. Um, if we go to the next slide, I'm gonna share the second, uh, the second strategy here, all right? So we talked about interspersing the tasks. What we're gonna talk about here is a topic called shared choice. So this is also something, both of these strategies are looking at keeping the motivation high, keeping our balloon full. So another thing that keeps our balloon full is if we can give the child, and this again, this applies to everyone. Hopefully you're seeing that, right? If I can give some choice between you know, what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, where we're going to do it, how we're going to do it. I keep that motivation high. Now, all this has to be realistic. It has to be safe. It has to be within reason, right? Uh, it can't just be that, oh, well, it's shared choice and my child chose to go to Disney World. So we got on a plane and we went down to Orlando, you know? Um, it, a lot of times it's from, you know, I'm structuring the choice, but the more choice that I have, and what happens with me, the more I'm bought in. So I gave a couple of examples here. If I'm looking at choosing the what, maybe the child chooses the activity, so that's what you're doing, and then I choose the room where it happens. If I look at the how, maybe the child chooses, uh, chooses the game, or sorry, I choose the game, I'm choosing the game, so that's what we're doing, and then the child chooses the rules. That's how we're playing the game. Another example, you show two activities and the child decides which one to do first. So that's them choosing when. And then the next one, you choose the activity, right? And the child chooses what room it's in. So that's where. What you notice from all these examples is that as the adult, I'm still structuring what happens, but I'm identifying something where, you know, maybe what rules we play sorry with isn't really that big a deal, right? You know, or maybe what room we choose to do an activity in isn't that big a deal. We can do it in the living room or we can do it in the bedroom. Now I have to identify beforehand that that's okay, right? Um, so sometimes people hear the shared choice and they think, oh, I'm kind of just only doing what the child wants. That's not what I'm advocating here. But what I'm saying is if there's a dimension of the activity that can go one of two different ways, if you can give the child some choice in that, some agency in what's happening with them, they're going to be more motivated as we all, as we all are, right? Think about yourself when you're putting this together. Someone comes up to me and says, Tim, here's what you're doing next. Here's exactly how you're doing it. 
here's where you're doing it. Here's, here's, you know, when you're doing it, you know, I might do it, but my motivation is going to be a little bit less as opposed to, Hey Tim, look, here's what you need to ha have accomplished by the end of the day, but where you do it and how you do it is up to you. Hmm, my motivation expands a little bit. Okay. So this is the shared choice. We maybe go to the next slide. All right. I'm, I'm going to show an example. Uh, but I want to go over a couple things before I show an example that, and I'm going to integrate in the task interspersal and, and the shared choice in there too. Transitioning between activities. This is a question I hear a lot from families, and it's kind of a big one. How do we transition through? A couple strategies. The first one, I love using a timer, and I call it use a timer and then another timer. It's this more time strategy. And the way I think about it is, if I want the child to transition 10 minutes from now, I might set a timer for eight minutes. And then when that timer goes off, it's kind of a sudden abrupt, especially if I'm transitioning from a preferred task or even something easy, right? If I can teach them to ask me for more time, hey, can I have a little bit more time? I keep the motivation high, right? So I chose beforehand that the transition is going to happen in 10 minutes. But if I can allow for that child to ask for more time, that again, gives them a little bit more choice, a little bit more agency, keeps the motivation higher. Now, if you don't have a timer, another recommendation that you could, because the other thing the timer does is it goes off. So when it goes off, it gives a transition cue, right? Like, oop, I heard a cue, that cues me that, oh, when the timer goes off, I go do something else. If you don't have a timer, I, I definitely recommend some sort of consistent transition signal. It could be a bell, it could be a hand clap. I put the Staples ZZ button on here just because one time I had a client and the client thought it was great and we'd always tap the Staples ZZ button every time we transition to something else. I know it sounds a little bit odd. I, I know it does, but it works. And it is based on human behavioral science. We, our brains look for signals and cues in the environment, right? And that cues our brain to do something and to look for something. And so if I have a consistent, a consistent transition, cue, bell, whatever that is, I'm much more likely to, to transition a little bit easier, okay? So a couple strategies there. We want to go to the next uh, slide. So another thing I hear a lot from families, and this is another really tricky thing, is are there some strategies when I'm transitioning from something preferred? So if I do something hard, if math is hard, and then I let my child know after math is done, you get some of that coveted iPad time, because I know that's preferred. So I got my hard, I took the motivation out, I'm giving the iPad, hopefully I'm moving the, a little more air in the balloon for motivation, but then I got to transition away from the iPad at some point. And what are some strategies there? So let me run through a couple. The first one that I recommend always, and this is just best practice, is you show the child when they're going to get the preferred item back on their schedule. So if I just come up to any, anyone and I say, you are terminating this preferred activity right now, and I have no idea when you're gonna get it back. You're like, wait a second, I all of a sudden want this thing way more than I did a second ago before you said that. Because I don't know when it's gonna be available again, right? You know, um, think about what we all did, you know, in the beginning of the coronavirus with uh, toilet paper, right? <laughs> we didn't know when it was gonna be available again, so all of a sudden I wanted a lot more than I did before, right? But if I can show the child, hey, look, I get it, we're transitioning away from the iPad right now, but but you're going to get it back at this time and they can count on that. It's never a guarantee, but it shows again, kind of like for us, people tried to assure us, you will be able to buy toilet paper again in the supermarket, right? <laughs> so that we can remain calm and know that I don't have to kind of hold on to it for dear life. Uh, so there's a strategy right there. Another strategy is uh, um, to, to use a timer. This is to show when the preferred item might come back. So if if you're gonna if you if you're gonna say hey we're gonna have the iPad again in 30 minutes or an hour or maybe you have to do it every 15 whatever it is if I can actually look at something whether I'm looking at the schedule and I know when my preferred's gonna come back or I look at a timer and I know when my preferred's gonna come back it does the same thing in the brain where now I don't have to panic and hold on to it with a tight grip because I know when it's coming back so a timer is another good strategy a transition token this is another research proven 
strategy to use. Sometimes if I'm transitioning away from a preferred activity, if I can find, they call it a, tr a transition token. So um, that it, it's, it's, it's a preferred item that can stay with the child during their other activities, right? So I think I have a couple of examples on here, but this could be, you know, a preferred, a preferred toy. Um, you know, it could even be like maybe the video goes with them and it's something that they use to kind of transition to get over somewhere else or really any object can kind of be conditioned for this. It's sort of a, 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 a you know, something where you're saying, well, it's not your preferred. I'm letting you know when you get the preferred back, but you have something still that you like that's tangible that you can see that helps you transition. All right. Now I do put a, a disclaimer on here that, you know, there are certainly children where even if you use some of these proactive strategies, transitioning away from that preferred activity is just going to require probably a little bit more level of analysis and a, a little bit more direct inter intervention. And I think if you get there, what I recommend is at that point, you really need to seek out some professional consultation from a BCBA because uh, you're probably going to have to do something a little more sophisticated clinically. And um, it, it, would, it, would, it would be better to do it lockstep with a clinician than if this is where we get to the realistic expectations, right? Those first three strategies I showed are things that can be done and have research to show that they can be done. But if you get a little bit deeper than that, and it's still really hard to transition from those preferred activities, I really, really advocate at that point to, to really seek out some consult. Tim, this is Sherry. Um, I yes. don't want to interrupt your flow. You're doing awesome. Um, just letting you know we're about halfway through. And I also want to remind participants that you can add questions and comments to the Q&A because we will definitely want to respond to those um, at the end of the presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Sherry. I'm going to keep on trucking through here. Um, okay, so here's an example. We will push this out so that people can have this and see, but I did want to get an example on here. This is tying together everything we just talked about. So if we look at, I have the, I, I have the, uh, the difficulty level, and then I have the activity. So what you see here is you're starting off with easy. You want to keep that balloon. I love starting off with easy. You know, let's start off with some fun things. Let's start off with some easy things and let's, let's get that balloon big. So we have a board game and then we do recess outside. Then I dipped into something moderate. Again, this is just an example. Your child's going to be different. But in this example, uh, this child, uh, you know, reading an ELA is a moderately difficult task. So then I do my moderate. And then I intersperse though. Then I go right to a preferred. So I'm going to have my balloon here again. Next time I do this, I'll get a real balloon. But my, my, my made up balloon right here. When I was doing the easy, I had it filling up a little bit. I did easy again. And then I did moderate right? It constricted. And then I got back to my preferred, right? And then to help me transition, I did an easy task along with a transition token. So if you think about that from a motivation standpoint, if I'm going from my preferred iPad and I'm expected to jump right back into a hard activity, very unlikely that's going to happen. So I jumped into an easy activity instead and I used a transition token. So now right? Now I'm back here. I did another easy task with snack. Hopefully my, my balloon's real big. And then I did a moderate again. And then I brought myself back to preferred, right? And then I went right from the preferred again to an easy task, which, which here is art. All right. So what I'm hoping you're kind of seeing from, from this is um, I'm adding in some, I'm interspersing those tasks, right? And also if you read a little bit into the activities, I have some shared choice in there too, right? So when I did the easy task, I'll, I'll do the first one, my board game. The child chose from a list of three board games that I knew I had available. I didn't just say what board game. And then they said, sorry. I'm like, ooh, we got to go to the toy store and we'll buy it, right? I gave the three ones that were available, but they chose which one. When we did recess, I chose where we play, right? But then the child chose what game to play from two options I gave them that I already know are safe and that we can actually do in that environment, okay? So this, I think, is a good example of I'm interspersing the tasks. I'm also using some shared choice. And there's some transition strategies that are embedded in here as well. So your child's going to obviously be different, but I think 
using this as a template and we'll have a clean template that we'll push out too. But using this as a template is really good and it keeps that balloon going. All right, so maybe we'll move on to the next slide. I do wanna talk about a couple of these habits, but Sherry makes a really good point. I wanna make sure we have time at the end for questions. So the, the other piece of this was I, I wanted to put in a couple habits that I recommend to families when I work with them that are just things that are, have been universally shown to be effective. And um, you know, they're not targeted at specific behaviors or uh, you know, specific needs. These are more general. So let's talk about the first one. If we go to the next slide, catch them being good, all right? That is not the technical term for this, but I think catch them being good is a lot easier way to say it. And what we're, what we're saying here is, and, and so the first bullet point, this tends to be opposite of the way our brain typically works. And again, I'm a parent of four, right? So typically I, I am reacting to my child when I see them doing something that I don't want them to do, right? So typically I'm in a state of maybe everything's okay. I see my, um, you know, my middle daughter hit my oldest daughter and I say, hey, stop doing that. We don't do that in this house. Now I'm not saying that we don't give that corrective feedback, right? But what I am recommending is if you can put in some cues and signals in your home to catch them being good. So in that example, if I could have, you know, had, and I recommend some of these things, especially in the beginning, when you're trying to drill in this habit, you want to have signals that signals, maybe you set a timer on your phone that goes off every 10 minutes, right? And you just look around and you think, which one of my children is doing something right now that I want them to continue doing? And then I'm going to go over to that child and I'm going to reinforce that, right? I'm going to say, great job. I love the way that you're playing nicely with your sister right now, right? And when you first start doing this, you know, your child might be like, um, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. You know, but don't under and never underestimate, especially if multiple children in your house, how powerful it is for one child to see another child get reinforcement. We mirror behaviors that we see get reinforced by other people in our life. So if you've ever seen the power, I was a school teacher at one time in my life. And I learned early on, if I signaled out one student, who was doing the right thing. And I said, Sherry, you are sitting so nicely right now. I'm gonna put your name up on the board for this. Everyone else sits, right? Cause they're like, oh, oh, there's reinforcement available. Oh, look at me, look at me. I'm sitting up, I'm doing really well, right? And um, you know, never underestimate the power of that. So this is just a habit, but it is a habit though. And, and remember it flies counterintuitive so the way our brains are kind of typically wired. So don't expect that you'd be an expert at it from the beginning. But if you set a timer or you put up what I say by signs with expected behavior, house rules, here's what is reinforced here, something like that, you see it, right? That could be your cue to say, oh yeah, that's right. Oh, I love the way you're doing this. Or if you have consistent check-in times, you could put it on your daily schedule. We're gonna check in. I'm gonna try to catch someone being good, catch the child doing what you want them to continue doing and then provide that feedback. So there's strategy number one. If we go to the next slide, strategy number two, they reinforce their own good behavior, all right? So this is one that sometimes I tell people, and they're like, eh, how am I gonna do that? So once you have set the behavioral expectations in your home, right? And what might be available for reinforcement if the, the, if, if the children in your home do those things, right? So if I make it clear to my middle daughter, hey, when you are playing nicely and safely with your sister, I will be delivering additional time on the iPad on your favorite app when I see that, right? I can then sometimes transition into a place where I teach, and you have to do this kind of systematically, but I teach my daughter, look, when you know that you engaged in that behavior, you come to me and you tell me, hey dad, I just wanted to let you know that I just played with my sister for 10 minutes and I had safe hands the whole time. So I'm gonna go and get my iPad and play on that app. Is that okay? Then I say yes, 
Now, I know that's sort of a utopian, it takes a long time to get there kind of thing. But I recommend, what I really recommend is I recommend starting off with the catch them being good. Start off with that one. And then this next one is one that if you can get here, it, you still have to set limits and expectations, right? You still have to, you know, it can't just be that, you know, you say, oh, they reinforce themselves. So they go and get whatever they want. No, you still set the expectation and what's available for reinforcement, but it starts to take some of the pressure off of you. Now, if the child can start coming to me and saying, hey, I engaged in this expected behavior, I engaged in that expected behavior, right? I'm looking for that reinforcement. Then it takes some of that pressure off of you to have to catch them being good. So this is almost like a 2.0 from the catch being good to, to move on to this, but another very, very effective strategy if you can get there. All right, so if we go to wrap up, I think that's good. Let me look at the time. All right, I'm doing okay. So if we kind of wrap up and then I really want to make sure I get to questions. First, make sure you be realistic and be very easy on yourself, right? It, it, no one would expect, you know, or hopefully wouldn't expect me to all of a sudden become a surgeon or a plumber or an electrician just because, you know, coronavirus hit and I saw a webinar, okay? You know, I might be expected to do a kind of a base level, right? <laughs> you know, but never to be an expert in the matter. So be realistic with yourself. And, and, and I think that that's very, very important. Um, every day, as we all know, and this was happening before COVID-19 and other things happening, but every day presents its own challenges. But I really strongly feel like starting with a schedule, so starting with a routine, it allows you to address those challenges that are gonna come up because you can, you can make changes from a template you already have. You already have a schedule. So then something comes up and you know their uncle's coming over and he wants to do this. You can, okay, you know what? We were going to do this task, but when the uncle comes over, that's a preferred. So maybe I'll kind of slide a moderate right here and then we'll spend time with our uncle and then we'll do this, right? You have something to go from then and that surprise visit from the uncle or you gotta go out to Target and do this it just gets integrated into the, into the schedule. Familiarity breeds calm. I, if you can take away something, I would definitely take that away. Routines aren't just there because it sounds nice. There's actually a, a lot of science that shows the more I get into a routine, the more my routine is familiar to me, the more calm I feel because my brain can predict what's gonna happen next. Behaviors don't change overnight. I wish they did. It would make my life, my, my job a lot easier if, if I, we just had a magic thing that we could do or snap our fingers a certain way and have behavior change. But your brain's also not wired that way. Your brain is wired to go with its current behavioral patterns unless compelled by days and days and days of evidence that there's more reinforcement for something else. So, you know, I think it's, it's a habit to get into. It's hard in the beginning. But once you do get into some of that, then then, then if you get the brain going in that direction, you'd have to convince it to go somewhere else. So just for, forewarned that in the beginning, as we all know from when we try to do new habits, it's very hard in the beginning. Um, and then choose one of the, the positive behavior support strategies. I recommend the first one, catch them being good. I think that having them reinforce themselves is almost a step two, but I would start with that first one, start slow and, and just go ahead and start there. So I think that, wraps up. I see at least a couple of questions in there. So um, I don't know, Sherry, uh, can I click and see those and address or? You're muted, Charlie. Oh, I see. Whoops, sorry about that. Yes, I'm glad that you, you can see the questions. We, we do have a few good questions that have come in. Um, before you get to those, I just want to say thank you. I love your examples. Love, love your advice. Um, and, you know, as a parent of two, it's, it's easy to sort of plug plug my own kids into that. Um, why don't we, yeah, why don't we take a look at these questions? So the first one, I can just read it out loud if it's easier. Right. Um, yeah. So sometimes it can be difficult to identify the level of each task because there are multiple dimensions to what makes things difficult. For example, something can be hard because it requires focus for a longer time, or maybe it has multiple steps. So can you speak to how parents and caregivers can identify different task levels? 
Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, I wish there was a simple answer for it because the, the real complex answer is that just because, just because a, a task was kind of easy for me yesterday, there, there, there could be variables that make it difficult for me today. So um, what, I, what I would recommend is this. Start off with a list to the best of your ability of putting them into those different categories, okay? You don't have to declare to the child what category you put them in when you put them on the schedule though, right? So if you identified something that you thought was an easy task or that seemed like an easy task yesterday, and, it's, and, and you can just see from knowing your child that this is a lot harder than it was yesterday, or it's a lot harder than I thought it might be, I would kind of make a course correction in the moment there and then go ahead and try to slip in after that something that you had, you had already identified is potentially easy or maybe even preferred. So that you don't have to feel like I set the schedule one time and it has to be like this, this entire day. You can mold and kind of adapt because it will be, it will be a bullseye that moves around. Uh, and, and I, you know, I, again, I, from having four children, I wish that it would just be very systematic and very routine. And what was easy yesterday will be easy now. What I can, what I can tell this person who put this question in one piece of good news is that the more I engage in a task, and, and especially the more I engage in a task when I start off motivated, the better I will eventually get at that task. And so uh, what, we, what, what, what happens oftentimes is that things move the other way too. You know, they start off as hard and then they move to moderate and then they move to easy. When you create that list of easy tasks, even initially, what you'll probably notice is that at one point those were hard tasks and they're only easy now because they've been practiced multiple times, right? So yeah, it, it does fluctuate. It's a very hard thing, but just know to whoever asked this question, don't feel like you, you're, you're required to, 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 to stick the schedule after you made it. Cor course correct. Realize that it's hard for them and then, and, then, and then make an adjustment midstream. That's okay to do. Great, thank you. Um, so another question, and this is about limit setting for um, reinforcers or rewards. So mm -hmm. um, this is an example of somebody says they see their brother doing a bunch of good behaviors to get more iPad time constantly. What's a good specific way to set limits on that type of thing? Right. So if I understand the question correctly, and, and make sure to maybe put it in if I don't, is, is the question... Um, so let's say theoretically I have two children, right? One is engaging in expected behaviors and I want to reinforce them for that. So they're, so they're getting maybe, yeah, some additional iPad time, but then I have another child who is maybe not yet engaging in those expected behaviors, but maybe they're showing some of their seeking behaviors that are not good, like a tantrum or screaming or yelling saying, my brother's getting the iPad and I'm not getting it. Is that, am I thumbs up on that? No, not, not, oh, no. not quite. Okay. Um, I, think, all right. All right. I think this might just be about limit setting for the reinforcer. So the iPad. Year. Okay. Right. You know? Like what's a, what's an acceptable limit. Okay. So I'm glad I clarified that because that is kind of a separate question. So I, I am not personally someone who would say you only do an hour of screen time or you only do two hours of screen time or three or four. I, I, I just personally, I have never read any compelling evidence that would compel me to, to say to a parent that, that I can w tell you that, that there is an actual kind of limit there. But what I will say for limit setting is start with a baseline. So if my baseline is that my child right now watches four hours of iPad per day, right? I might set an initial limit at three hours and 45 minutes, right? But I'm not going to set it at 30 minutes because I read it in an article and someone told me that I should. Because I'm looking at progress from baseline. That is one thing we're trained as behavior analysts, right? Is that when I do an, an assessment or I recommend a behavior change program for an individual, I am recommending it for them. I'm getting their baseline and then I am moving from their baseline, 
right? Another way that I describe this a lot of the time, a lot of times is if someone came to me and said, Hey, I want to run the Boston marathon next year. Right. My first question would be, how often do you run now? And if they say never do, nope, I only run if I'm getting chased, but I want to run the Boston marathon. Am I going to tell them, well, I read an article. And it said that you should go out and try to run 10 miles right now because you've got to run the Boston Marathon. Now, I'm going to say if your baseline is zero miles right now, let's go out and take a half mile walk and let's start there. And then let's go to a mile. So, so that would be my long winded way of saying start at a baseline where you are and then set the limit just a bit lower than that. If you don't, we all know what's going to happen. If I'm used to four hours iPad a day and you try to go to half an hour, it's, it's going to be really difficult. And then you're probably going to scrap it and it'll become four and a half hours, right? Because it's going to be so hard. Great. Um, continue, continue putting in your questions. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, the clarification. So, so it's less about limiting the iPad time, more about misusing the reinforcement model. Um, and I apologize because I don't know how to, Raji, I'd love to let you ask, actually ask this question and clarify, but I'm not sure. And how... we can get back. I think the other thing too is I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable to, you know, if there's a follow-up, maybe an email, if people have a very specific kind of question, I'm very much available. I don't, uh, don't feel that this is the only time to ask. I could follow up and do an email if it's a little more specific. I want to make sure that everyone's questions get answered. Uh, I have a I have a question for you, Tim. Um, sure. So, how do you feel about? Um, and I know there's a technical ABA term for this, but like sort of like a three strikes and you're out kind of around behavior. So, for example, my youngest daughter, who is six, I mean, she lives for watching shows. She, as she says, she likes real school. She does not like homeschool. And <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I say, Mama too. Yeah, um, that's right. Right. Well, and, you're with her on that. <laughs> and, you know, so throughout the day, she is, you know, complaining, tantruming, begging to get to watch her shows to be done with school. And so one of the things that, I, that I've done with her um, is have like three boxes. And so, and she, and the, and she knows, so the rule is, you know, we, we can't complain, we can't tantrum we can't cry we can't scream for watching our shows and if we do that we get an x in our box and if we get all three boxes x'd out then we're not watching shows later um right. and for her as soon as we get that one box forget it i mean she is so good she's you know she's good um yep. so what are your feelings about something like that so so that's that's called a, the tango term as a response cost so that means if I engage in a certain response, so for your daughter, it sounds like complaining, whining, asking for the show, I get a cost, which is that first, that first X. Some children respond, it sounds like exactly like your daughter, where like they get even close to the potential, like, you know, aversive event that would be no, no videos. And that corrects behavior right there, right? I would say if that's the case, that's an, that's, that, that effect, that strategy has been shown to be effective, keep using, okay? So the other people that are on here, the, the one thing through the research that could be a downfall to it, though, is that if you end up at some point getting to that third strike, there's nothing left in the toolbox, right? You know, like the, the, now the TV is gone, and if it's 10 a.m., it's going to be a long day, <laughs> right? It's going to be a really long day. So, so it's, it's definitely something to try. But, and, and if it's effective, Sherry, I would say just keep going with it. The, the, the alternative to that is to do something where you work up to minutes of time watching TV by engaging in expected behavior, right? So whereas that strategy says, if you do something unexpected or, not, or, or that is not acceptable, you get the X. What I could say is, hey, look, in the next half hour, every 10 minutes that goes by that you are you know, doing your work, you are not yelling and screaming at mom, you will get a check mark or a smiley face there. And then each one of those is worth two minutes on the TV, five minutes, whatever it is, right? Then if one of those 10 minutes is just horrible and there's whining and there's crying and it's really bad, right? 
the consequence for that is that no check mark gets put in that box. But then the next 10 minutes, I start again. And I say, hey, look, that was a tough 10 minutes, right? I, I apologize, but you lost your TV for that time. All right. But good news for you is that the same rules apply for this block of time and you can earn more. And then the other thing that you can do in there too is you can, you can mix in other expected behaviors that you might want your child to do. So you could say, hey, you get the check mark for not you know, whining and crying. And if you go and give your sister a compliment, you get an extra smiley face and an extra two minutes of time, right? So you can get a little sophisticated with that. But, but yeah, it, but Jerry, for you, if it's effective, I tell people, you found an effective strategy, you use it, you know? But to other people on here, that's just the only potential side effect is if you get to the last one and it's 10, like just, you know, could be a long day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we've had those. Yeah. We've yeah have you? Oh, no. Okay. Um, well, we've had those, not, right. <laughs> not, not because we've lost our, our boxes, but, you know, just. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, this is great. Uh, I'm not seeing additional questions in the Q and A. Um, we have a couple, just a couple of minutes left. I had, I did have a question though, a different one, and this may be a little complicated to answer or hard, but I'm wondering with your clients or even with your kids, you know, for those who are having trouble engaging with perhaps their virtual learning, I mean, like class direct, you know, teachers, Google Classroom, Zooms, etc. Is there any just general kind of advice or thoughts that you have about that or things that you see have worked or just kind of what you say in, in that circumstance? Yeah, yeah, I, so I, we've seen this with clients at New England ABA and I've seen it with my own daughter. So uh, the, the, you know, what I recommend is almost similar to what we talked about in this presentation where um, I have to come up with a way that if, so, so let's take my daughter, for example, she is not a zoom person, <laughs> you know, and especially when, so she's in first grade and when they do the whole, all the first graders, it, you know, and, and she has to wait for everyone to talk, she's getting up, she's walking away from the zoom or she's making funny faces or doing whatever. Right. So, you know, what, what, what I implemented there is I implemented kind of what I just described where broke the time. Uh, of the, even though the Zoom was going to be a half hour, I broke it up into, I think I did five minute intervals with her, right? And I said, look, what I'm expecting for you to do is I'm expecting for you to stay here in, you know, in the screen and respond when the teacher talks to you, right? Every time you do that, you got, I mean, we did like a little smiley face, right? And then I established the preferred reward that she would have at the end for the amount of smiley faces that she gets, right? The other thing that we did kind of as we went is I built in breaks for her to go off screen when it wasn't her turn to talk for small periods of time, right? So that gave her a little bit of an out to be able to, if I think about the balloon again, right? To her, she was letting air out of the balloon the whole time on the Zoom. It was a moderate to a hard task. And once she got here, she was doing the faces and doing all the other stuff. If I let her have a little break off the screen, very small, I bring, I, I, I bring it up, right? And then we did some choice in there too. Now that I'm thinking through the whole, we did this a couple months ago, we added some choice in there. So we added, where do you want to bring the, you know, the laptop to do it, right? Um, who do you want to have come with you? She has a little baby Emma doll that she could have down here, not up here, but down here, right? So she got to choose a little bit of the where, you know, not so much the how or the when that was all chosen for her, but we mixed in a little bit of that choice in there too. And all those things are just helping to fill up the balloon and, but different children are going to need the balloon more than others. Some children, like as soon as they get on the screen, it goes, Boo! right. Cause they hate the screen. Right. So for that, you just might have to, again, I'll, I'll go back to the progress and baseline. If I'm working with a client and their baseline is that they can sit in front of the screen for one second, well, then I'm trying to get to two seconds. I'm not trying to get to some norm where they, where they sit for 30 if they're starting at zero, right? You know, I'm trying to have them get their baseline up and trying to motivate them to be here with me. And we've had to do this with some clients too. Some of our clients love telehealth. We started doing telehealth and they were like, oh, let me screen, let me show you, uh, you know, what I can do on my computer, right? And it was amazing 
others, very difficult. And we had to go, we had to go to just that. Just the goal that we're working on is to find a, a, you know, a, a reinforcement system that works, that gets them motivated to just be here on the screen with me. Um, but sometimes we do that with face-to-face -face sessions too. I mean, that's not uncommon, you know, that the first thing we work on for even months in the beginning is just attending. Attend to me. You know, I am a source of reinforcement. I, you know, I, I am a source of things that you're going to like. You're going to want to interact with me. So, uh, but that can be hard to do, and it's very specific for different kids. Well, Tim, as always, you are a source for us of things to have, of, of great information um, delivered in a way that is really, really um, amusing and, and easy to understand. So thank you for that. I do just want to read one last comment. Um, it would be great as part of future sessions, this isn't necessarily for you, Tim, to work schedules for older elementary school kids when school is out and camp is um, not likely to be happening. So, so we can give that a thought. Absolutely. And just so people know that are that are attending here, I, you know, I'm very open to, um, you know, assisting after this call, you know, shoot an email to the BMC Alton and then share, you know, how to get in touch with me. Uh, you know, I'm very willing to have some time to, you know, give a consult or take a look at the schedule. Yeah, we're staring down the barrel of that too. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's going to be a lot of ESY happening, at least face to face or camps in the summertime. So uh, yeah, I'm very willing to help with that even after the call for individuals to uh, catch up children. That's great. Thank you so much. And we can think about putting together a session on sort of getting through the summer. Um, that might be might be a good one for, for all of us. Yeah. Um, I'll probably be an attendee of that one. Uh, unless you want to, you know, we're trying to figure it out too. It, it, it's, yeah, it, it's a very tough time for everybody. But uh, well, we so, so, so appreciate your time with us today and so appreciate everybody um, who has joined us for this. So we will send an email following up with uh, Tim's PowerPoint and with any additional resources. Um, please uh, see our future sessions and join us for those if you're able to. Otherwise, check out our website where they will also live. Um, thank you so much, Tim. Really, you just... Anytime we ask you to, to be there for us, you are, and, um, and we really genuinely appreciate that so very much. Thank my you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great to be here. Okay. All right. Take care, everyone. Have good days. Okay. Have a good one, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.